Well, what a privilege for me to speak into your financial wholeness series. And uh, I want to greet everybody that's watching online. Can we put our hands together and say hi to the world? <laughs> so good to see everybody. People, the last service, people from California were watching into this. So uh, that's really, really cool. So I want to talk about this today. I want us to take us into a journey into the word enough. Everyone say enough. enough. Why don't we say enough is enough? enough is okay, so I'm a child of the 80s, a teenager in the time of the 80s when we really recovered fashion from the 1970s. The 1970s was a bad time for fashion. How many people can remember that? Come on, put up your hand if you still can, if you're physically able to. Um, okay, and then we got into the 80s. How many people believe the greatest music was in the 80s? Oh, yeah, great music from the, I love the music from the 80s, the Eurythmics. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, but, but something happened in 1984. All, basically, all of us were assaulted by uh, news images that came from Ethiopia. There was a famine there of biblical proportions. And some people said, we got to do something about this, not just watch it on television. And one of those was a guy called Bob Geldof. And he was an Irishman. He's quite a quiet guy. Uh, no, he's not. He's a bit crazy. And so he said, all the music artists should get together and make a single. And, and so what he did was he lied his way around all the number one bands of the day. So he rang like Freddie Mercury of Queen and he said, ah, you two are on board, so you better get on board. And you two weren't on board at that moment in time, but it was like this peer pressure that he did in everyone. So he got all the world's leading artists. I think it was Abbey Road, uh, Abbey Road Studios in London, got them together. And if you've never heard of all of this, you will have heard of this, the Christmas single, Feed the World. How many people, yeah, I, I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to sing. It, okay, and um, maybe we should feed the world. Let them know it's That's pretty good. You're a good church. Okay, feed the world. So we did that, but this is what they found: with all the money that was raised from the sing from the single, the seals of the single, they still didn't have. You're getting, they still didn't have enough. So then Bob said, well, then we're going to get all these artists on stage at Wembley in July 1985, and it was called Live Aid. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, probably the greatest musical event in history, Live Aid. Uh, and people got together, everyone wanted to be on the stage. That's Wembley, everyone, filled to the gills. But not only did it happen in we Wembley, on, on the same day, they had a counterpart in Philadelphia in the JFK studio. Uh, the JFK Stadium. And what happened was that um, uh, uh, Phil Collins from Genesis, he did a whole set in Wembley, got on Concord. Anyone remember Concord? Fastest passenger plane ever. And it took him across to America and he performed on the same day on the counterpart stadium there in Philadelphia. That's pretty cool, isn't it, everyone? That's pretty cool. So what happened was, 1.9 billion people were watching that day on television. That's pretty incredible. But they weren't giving money. They were all enjoying the music and the set. Sounds like church sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so... They're all having a good time, but no one was investing. So Bob Geldof went full Irish at that moment. He burst into the BBC studio in, Long in uh, Wembley and basically got on live television and he said, you're all just watching and you're not giving. This is not about the music. This is about starving kids in Africa who don't have and you have more than so give us your, and he used words that I can't stay or say on stage that had never been said on live television before and trust an Irishman to do that, okay? And what happened from that moment was literally a tsunami of generosity came in, a tsunami of generosity. And from that moment, every second, $500 was being given, every single second. And they raised almost a billion dollars out of that concert. How many people think that's pretty incredible? Pretty incredible. And so a couple of things on that. One I want to say to you, audacious, this message today, and I'm going to be as bold enough to say this, that I believe is for you as a church, because you as a church have a breakthrough anointing upon you as a congregation. And this is not just about what God wants to do in this church. 
or what he wants to do in Manchester, but I believe in model churches like Antioch in the New Testament, that you need to be a model church. And if you have the breakthrough and generosity in this place, do you know what? No one else in the UK can ignore it. So I don't, I'm not here to tell you stories about California because you can dismiss that. Or a big church in London because everyone else turns, well, that's London and it's not here. Everybody, God wants to do a miracle of generosity in Manchester that Europe cannot ignore. Yes? So we're going to look at an Old Testament passage when God wanted to build a tabernacle. I think there's a picture of it there. And it was basically a tent. Now, it was like the Old Testament tent. What is a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a place where God wants to manifest his glory. You are a tabernacle. Look at me. We are tabernacles of the Holy Spirit individually, and we're also tabernacles of the Holy Spirit corporately. And God wanted to create a tabernacle. So he said to the people of Israel, we need an offering to do this. Watch what happens. This is the opposite of Live Aid and Bob Geldof, where he walked in and said, we don't have... Where do you see what happens here with Moses? So let's look at this here. Um, Exodus chapter 36 and starting at verse 4. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work in the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, well, why did they leave? Look at this here. The people are bringing more than They're bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Imagine if Pastor Glenn and Soph had to send out a memo where we can't have an offering this week because everyone that's involved in finances still haven't counted the offering from last week because there was too much money coming in. Wouldn't that just be amazing if he said, no offering this week because we got too much last week. Would you people calm down? Stop being so generous. Come on, everybody. Are you believing for a miracle? This is what was happening here. Then Moses gave an order, not a suggestion. He gave an order that they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And I love this. And so the people were restrained from bringing more. <laughs> Imagine again, Pastor Glenning said, said, what we're going to do is just take an offering from the first three rows. The rest of you can't get involved. Because we know that we're going to get too much from these people. Imagine if we had to say, right, you, would you sit down, stop writing your check, you can't give it in today. Put away your credit cards. Security, would you stop these people from giving? Can you see the culture that was created when God gets into his people and they get a vision of what can happen of God's glory on earth, everybody? It's all to do with generosity. And look at this here, because what they already had was what? It was more than to do all the work of God. So here we're going to, if you're writing notes today, point number one, there's going to be four points, okay? Point number one is real simple. I have enough to celebrate, and what is it? Celebrate 100%. Celebrate 100%. You see, what had happened in the previous chapter, chapter 35, God had given out this command, and he says, basically, ask everyone who is willing. Everyone who is willing. This is really important. If God doesn't get your will, he'll never get your wallet. Some of us were trying to move our wallet to generosity when it needs to be our will is moved to generosity. God wants to get inside your will. When you get your will aligned with God's will, a tsunami of generosity comes from your wallet. There's an automatic connection. You see, we used to say this, it needs to drop from your head to your heart. Isn't that right? Did you ever heard that before? It needs to drop from your head to your heart. But don't stop there, everyone. It needs to drop from your heart to your pocket. (laughs) That's where it needs to go. Because if you get a vision of this here, God wants to do something extraordinary through this church, everybody. Something extraordinary. And we won't just do it on a few tips. It won't happen with putting God as an afterthought. God needs to be part of our first thought. And how do we get to that place? We start celebrating life, everybody. I love these quotes. Look at these quotes here. H.A. Ironside, he said this. We would worry less if we praise more. Thanksgiving is the enemy of discontent and dissatisfaction. 
This is what I find in life. I can either go to all the side of prayer requests or I can live my life with praise reports. Now God wants prayer requests and you've got them over here on the side tables. Fill in your prayer requests, but I want my praise reports to be bigger than my prayer requests, yes? Have you ever found this in life, that most of my life I spend it in health? I spend it in health, okay? And some of my life, there's ill health, like man flu. How many guys know that is serious condition, man flu, okay? Normally what comes with it is a bout of depression with man flu because we think we're going to die. And what happens is that when I get illness in my life, I am quick to get on my knees. God, would you heal me now? God, why am I sick? Praise reports go up. But what I find in life, what I need, or sorry, prayer requests go up when I'm sick, But what should happen is that when I'm healthy, I should be praising God all the time. Yes, that I can lift my feet out of bed, that I can stand to my feet, that I can get dressed, that I can run, that I can exercise, that I can eat. Excuse me, even the Jews used to thank God for the ability to go to the bathroom. Because you know if you can't go to the bathroom, you're sitting on the toilet and you're praying. Yes? And if everything's working, we should be sitting on the toilet praising. Are you with me, everybody? Yes? <laughs> yes? This is going to hit you today. This is going to hit you today, okay? There's going to be singing coming from your bathroom. Abraham Lincoln, he said this. We can complain about the rose bushes. We can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Do you see the difference here, everyone? So I'm going to ask you, celebrate. Ce- celebrate what? what? What do we get to celebrate? Well, we get to celebrate 100%. I have enough to celebrate. What is it? It's 100% of life, everybody. That I've got a wife that loves me. That I get to celebrate 25 years of marriage this year, everybody. Yes? I get to celebrate that, that I've got four kids who love Jesus. I get to celebrate that. And do you know what? If God never give me another thing in my life, I've got enough to celebrate. Come on, jump up on your feet with me. And I want you to give him some praise and some celebration. Can we do this? Praise God for what he has given us. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. You're generous to us in every single way. Amen. Isn't God good? Turn around to someone and say, I've got more than enough. I've got more than enough. You see, we, celebration is just, it's a choice. It's a revelation, everyone. So just recently, uh, we had a delivery from what we call Costco. It's like Tesco. Anyone do online shopping? Online shop, isn't it wonderful to see the Sainsbury's van or the Tesco van pull up? Well, we got Costco and they delivered to our house and we actually went out and helped the lady. We brought some stuff in and you're gonna laugh at this, but do you know what happened? We added to our basket, Isabel saw it, it's a roast chicken ready cooked. How many people do that? You ever go to the supermarket, you pick up ones already cooked? Well, guess what happened? She brought it to our house She walked into the house. She handed me the chicken that had already been cooked. Guess what, everyone? I filled up emotionally. Like tears came into my eyes, everyone. You're going to laugh at this, okay? But this is the truth. I thought, God, how privileged am I to be living in the world where I can sit in my house, click a button, and someone will bring a ready-cooked chicken to my house. Yes? I mean, it absolutely blew me away. The fact that we have dominoes, don't take it for granted. And I thought to myself, God, if I ever get to the point in life where I just take food, a shower in the morning, soap, yes, everyone, transport, yes, Netflix or Amazon, everything that we get in life, it is an absolute privilege. And this is the way that I live my life. I mean, I am thrilled to be born again but I'm just thrilled to be born at all. Yes, life is so good. We got to make a choice to celebrate. So is everyone with me? Okay, so I have enough to celebrate. How many percent? 
100 percent. Well, this leads us to the next one. If I get that revelation, then I understand that I have enough to tithe. How many percent? Do you can say it? Okay, okay. I have enough to tithe. How many percent? Ten percent. Now, some of you right now, you're sitting there and you're freaking out. Because I use like the Christian swear word, the Christian cuss word, tithe. He said the T word. I can't believe it. He said the T word. Now, if you are here today as a visitor and like your first time guest along, we want to say you are so, so welcome. It's your first time getting online. You are so, so welcome. You are our friend today. You are our guest. I have a friend from Ireland, and yes, his name is Paddy. <laughs> I lie not. I lie not. Like all my French friends are called Pierre. No, he really is. He's called Paddy. And Paddy was raised in the northwest of Ireland in an area of Donegal called the Gaeltic. And basically, in that area, uh, they speak the Gaelic language. So he went to school to learn English. He was just raised learning uh, or speaking Gaelic. And this is one thing that he told me, and this is to put all our visitors at ease, all right? He said, when it came to family discussions or family business, like the family needed to talk, they would get in a circle, they would speak in Gaelic, and they would do it in hushed tones. That's how they did it. Get in a circle, speak in Gaelic, and do it in hushed tones. If you're a visitor today, Audacious Church right now is forming a circle. We're talking some family business here. You get to listen in. <laughs> and what we're going to do, we're going to speak in hushed tones, and I'm going to shout at nobody about money. Is that okay, everyone? Are we all ready for this journey? So if you're a visitor, just enjoy yourself, okay, as we talk to the family. Tithing, it's just so important. It comes from a revelation that I celebrate 100% in life. So naturally what I do is I move to the 10% giving that to God. Like some Christians have not got this revelation. They're still in a stingy mentality. They've met a generous God who's forgiven them of their complete past, who says, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. A billion years from now, I've got you covered. The best pension plan in eternity, everybody. And yet they're worried about their little paycheck and holding on to it. Some Christians hold a five-pound note so tight, the queen is crying, everyone. You are killing and choking the queen. What is the tithe all about? What does the tithe represent? Someone on the screen here. The tithe represents the first 10% of the whole. So it has been a biblical principle way before the law, right from the time of Abraham, of where we give our first fruits to God. And the practice has been, the tradition of the church, that it is the first 10% of everything that comes in. Let's call it our salary, your pension, whatever you get in life. Now, this is important. I'm not trying to take something from you today. I'm trying to give something to you today, which is a revelation. And this is the revelation that if we put God first in our lives, if we put God first in our marriages, if we put God first in our families, if we put God first in our finances and all of those areas, we will reap an incredible reward. That's where it comes from. So the tithe is the first fruit. It's the first thing that we give out of our paycheck. And Isabel and I, we have practiced this all of our lives. The very first thing that comes out, it's not the last thing. God is my first thought in my finances, not my leftover. He doesn't get the leftovers, he gets the first fruit. Is everyone still with me, okay? Because some of you right now, you haven't got the revelation. And I can either give out of reason, or I can give out of revelation. And when you get the revelation, this is the revelation, everyone. God can do more with the 90% after I've given my 10% that I can do with my keeping all the 100%. I'm bringing God into my finances. How many people want God to be involved in their finances? 
It's absolutely pivotal to our lives. Absolutely incredible. So I've got a friend in California. He's got a, a business down in Southern Cal. He's an Irishman that moved to California years ago, literally to make his fortune. He's always had the ability to manage people and get them into the workplace. So what he does is like a casual labor thing that people just want some immediate work. He just matches them up with big companies. Ended up that he had 5,000 people on his books. Some companies would call in the middle of the night and say, we're going to need seven people on the production line at 7 a.m. He would get them there. He just had this ability. He had two businesses in his life. And one day I went to see him in his offices, very humble offices in Southern California. And this one was what was called the Lord's business. And this is what he said. All the profit of this company goes to the Lord. He said, now that one over there, that business over there, that's the family business. And all the profit goes to the family. But what I focus on is the Lord's business. And I'm talking, he was making millions, everybody. And all the profit went towards kingdom projects. This is amazing. And I said to him, Joe, why are you so generous? This is what he said. He said, Andrew, for 48 years, I served the wrong God and gave him everything. Why, when I found the right God, would I give him less? It's amazing. But listen, it all started with 10% and Joe was able to move to 100%. Isn't that amazing, everybody? But God says, your baseline is 10%. When are you going to start doing this? I'm going to encourage you Start today. Don't wait. Don't wait until you think you have. I have enough right now because I've learned to celebrate the 100%. (laughs) Okay? And the natural thing is to start at the baseline of the 10%. Isabel and I, we learned this early on. Or actually, I learned it from her earlier on because she's smarter than me, everyone. And so when we got married, what we said to all our wedding guests was, would you, instead of giving us gifts, would you give us a financial gift? Because we're getting married in Ireland, but we're going to be living in Scotland, and we're going to have to get all that stuff, all those toasters and all the cutlery and all the stuff that you get when you get married, and we're going to have to then get it across to Scotland. It's easier to buy it in Scotland and just put it in our home. And people were very kind, and they said yes. So back in the day, we got about 3,000 pounds in gifts. I was like, wow, isn't this amazing? Never seen it in my life before. 3,000 pounds. I sat up all night and looked at it. It was incredible. Then this is what Isabel said. We should tithe of that. And I was like, no. (laughs) No, Isabel, we didn't earn that. That was a gift to us. That was a gift to us. What I was saying at that moment in time was, I'll manage my money, not God. Not God. So Isabel looked at me, and because I was all of this thing, well, if they had bought us a kettle, we couldn't have tithed 10% off it. It's not like we could put a plug in the offering or something like that, cut the lead off. We couldn't have done that, Isabel. We just asked for the money. You know, you know you're trying to reason your way. Reason, no revelation. So Isabel asked me the question there and then. She said, how long do you want to be married to me? <laughs> and I said the biblical thing. For the rest of our lives, for the rest of my life, I want to be married to you. And she said, do you think we're going to need God to keep us together for the rest of our lives? I said, evidently, we are going to need him. Um, And she said, well, why don't we put him first right at the beginning of our marriage in the hope and in faith that he'll be with us and provide all the needs for the rest of our marriage? Because our marriage, our union of two people became a family of six people. And that's a lot more expensive, everybody. (laughs) And listen to this. When we tithed off that money, it didn't make us millionaires. But what it did, everybody, this is really important. It made us put God first in our finances. And from that moment, I know this, everybody. He has been a faithful, faithful God. 
a faithful, faithful God, right through to this very moment. Are you with me, everybody? So we've got how much to celebrate? How much to tithe? 10%. And I just, let me throw this one in. Christians that have been here a long time. I struggle with Christians that have been a Christian for a long time that aren't yet tithing and are still negotiating with God. So um, we do this missions trip, and please do not be, be inspired by the numbers, don't be put off by them. But once a year, we send 1,100 people, 1,100 people into Mexico on mission at a single time all in the one place. It's an incredible trip. And so this guy, Diego, who's a local guy, absolutely fluent in Spanish, not a Christian, decides to go on the trip to help Bayside as an interpreter. So he's down there. He's never been to church in his life and doesn't know any of this stuff, but he's having to translate the gospel message every day. So... <laughs> One time, my wife is with them, and she is talking to a whole bunch of kids, tells them about Christ, and this is Diego's testimony. He turns around and he goes, he says, he said, am I telling this to them, or am I speaking to myself? And he ended up saying the sinner's prayer. Yes, he was translating it, but he prayed it for himself that day, and in Mexico, he became a Christian. So, this is like, Wow. So after Mexico, it's Easter Sunday. He comes to church. So that was like his first church experience after Easter Sunday. Incredible. He could hardly get a seat. It was amazing. But his first normal Sunday, we're doing just what you're doing right now, a financial wholeness series. And do you know what Isabel and I are thinking? Oh, my goodness. All the Sundays for Diego to come to is to come to this one, and we're talking about money. And we had an outside speaker in. And I have to admit, I was slightly nervous. But the guy that spoke that day was incredible. I saw Diego afterwards, and I walked up, you know, and slightly nervous. And I said, hey, how are you? And he said, I'm amazing. And I said, what happened? He said, two weeks ago, Jesus came into my heart. Today, this is what he said. That guy who was speaking opened up a world that I have never seen before. I have never heard this stuff. Why has no one ever told me this in my life? He said, we are going to start this week. And then we were doing a special campaign like you're doing for your building. We are going to go home and we are, this is talking about him and his wife, we're going home to talk about what we can do for that as well. And we're opening up our house to an intern that's going to work at the church. We're going to become a host family. Literally, in three weeks, everyone, he'd become a Christian, he'd come to church for Easter, and then become a tither and was doing offerings as well. Listen to me, everyone. When you start to celebrate life to 100%, when Jesus gets inside of you, it just happens. It just happens, everybody. Don't hang around. Get involved. So where do we go from here? Well, I've got enough to celebrate. How many percent? I've got enough to tithe. How many percent? And then... That leaves me with this. I've got enough to share. 90, or let's go, whatever percent. What is God saying for you and what's he saying to me? Do you know if you've got goldfish at home and they go around that bowl, this is the truth, everyone. If you just get that uh, food, and you keep putting it in, keep putting it in, keep putting it in, keep putting it in. Get, what are they going to do? They're going to die. Because guess what they're going to do? They're just going to keep eating it. Because a goldfish doesn't have the sense to understand when enough is. And a revelation needs to come into our lives that God has given us more than enough. 
And if all we do, even if we're tithers, even if we go, okay, I've got God at the front of my finances, first in my finances, what are you going to do with the other 90%? And this is not, oh, please give the church more. No, it's not, everyone. This is about go out into that world and bless every single person you meet and with every opportunity that you have, act like Jesus and be generous with all your stuff. Yes? And don't be like the goldfish that's just going round the bowl. Selfridges, House of Fraser, another car. And not, don't do it. Take what you have. This is a revelation that I got once, that I actually don't own a house. I do own a house, technically, but I don't own a house. I run an Airbnb for the kingdom of God. It's not my home. Who does that home belong to? It belongs to God. It's God's home. God gave me the money and the ability to create wealth to purchase the home. It's not my home at all. God gave me that home, and he could take it off me tomorrow if I start worshiping it. This is the really important thing. With stuff and with money, you either worship it or worship with it. You either worship it or you worship with it. So I don't own a car. I don't own a car. I do have a car, but I don't own it. I am an Uber driver for the kingdom of God. So if someone ever asks you, can I have your car? Don't answer it. Ask the owner, God, can that person have your car that I steward here on earth? Are you with me, everyone? God, I need, now some of you right now, you are sitting and you are intimidated by this. Let me bring you back to the story. There's a really important passage here in Exodus 35. I think we're going to get it up on the screen here, verses 4 to 6. It's like the expanded version. You ready here, everyone? It says, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have. Not from what you don't have, but from what you have. I was with someone just recently. They have a lot. (laughs) I don't have what they have, but I have what I have. That's what God is looking for, is generosity from what I have. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is, what's the word there? Willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold. Anyone in here have gold? Little bits of it, some of it round our finger. Anyone got bullion? Please, if you have, see me at the end of the service. Bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen. Look at this here. Goat hair. Look what God put in there, everyone. Goat hair. Anyone got goat hair with them today? Look what God did here in the list of what he was looking for to build a tabernacle. God said, we're going to need gold for the Ark of the Covenant But if you don't have gold, you're still in because if all you have is a goat, shave it, bring its hair along because we're going to need to build curtains for the glory of God. Can you see what's happening here, everyone? Whatever you have, you're in. Never count yourself out. So if you're here and you're a minimum wage, it's either gold or goat hair. And God does not, God never responds to the amount, God responds to the sacrifice. And you know what? If a pound for you is sacrificed, all of heaven is going, wow! Look at my son, look at my daughter, look at how generous they really are. We always have enough to share, enough to share. So my friend Gordon, he, um, he works in a teen challenge center in the northeast of Scotland, a recovering um, alcoholic, and he is just an incredible guy, a real heart of compassion. And once Christ forgave him, this is it, everyone, he got the revelation that his life was saved and he celebrates 100% of life. And it spills over into generosity towards other people. And so what he decided to do to raise money for a girl's center, a rehab center in the northeast of Scotland, he said, I'm going to go on the streets of the major cities of the United Kingdom, I'm going to live with the homeless. I'm going to document it online. I'm not bringing any money with me at all. Left all the credit cards, stuff like that. It was an amazing journey. Every day I'd be on Facebook following him. 
And this is one of the stories that he told me. He started off in London that has a huge homeless problem. And he got to meet some really good guys, and one of them was called Mick. And Mick, like, took Gordon under his wing and basically said to him, never sleep there. That's a dangerous area. Stay with us as a crowd. Actually sleep right in here. And just cared on him and just loved on him. Gordon said it was an amazing experience. He said on the Friday of that first week, and he was about to move on to a major city after that, he saw Mick in the morning. And Mick was counting through the money that people had given to him from begging on the streets of London. Gordon says it was an incredible experience. People would come up. Some people would just throw a couple of pence in. Some people a pound. Some people 20 pound notes. Other people would kick you, physically kick you. He says, but Mick was sitting there and he was counting his money. But he was getting all the coppers and putting them to the side in a little bank bag that he had. And Gordon said to him, what are you doing? He says, I'm separating my money. He says, what are you doing with your coppers? Oh, he says, I'm going to McDonald's. He says, you getting the cheeseburger? He said, no. He said, what are you getting? What are you going to eat? And he went, nothing. He went, oh, well, why are you going to McDonald's? And he was a bit slow in answering, but Gordon pushed him and said, why are you going to McDonald's? And he said, I do this every Friday. I get all my coppers put them to the side, put them in this little bag. I go into McDonald's, and you know just beside the till, there's that little glass box for charity. He said, I put all my coppers in there for the children because I realize there's some people in the world that are worse off than me. Are you with me, everybody? Do you know what it is possible to have a big bank account, but a shrunken heart. I pray to God that that is never my story, everybody. I pray that while I have breath in my life, that I have a revelation, that I have to celebrate everything and everyone. That I have the ability to leave here today, to go out there and just bless and bless and bless and bless. And sometimes it's not always money. Sometimes it's just words. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's just a hug. Just be wildly generous. I have enough to celebrate. How many percent? I have enough to tithe. How many percent? I have enough to share. How many percent? Whatever. It's over to you and God. And then finally, I have enough to leave. Guess how much I'm leaving, everybody? A hundred percent. Anyone bringing any money into eternity? Anyone bringing their car to heaven? Yeah, you know that car that you love, your Subaru Impressa, whatever you drive and you worship it. And you, not wrong with having it, you just can't worship it. I get to leave 100%. So do you, we get to leave 100%. Look at this verse here. This verse is from 1 Timothy chapter 6. And it is amazing. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We were all born buck naked, everybody, in our birthday suit. And we can take nothing out of it. I'm going to get to leave 100%. And just recently, this hit me square on. Because we remortgaged our house and in part of doing that, we had to make a will. I never made a will in my life before. So we'd sit down in an office with a guy about 20 years younger than me, asking me questions I'd never answered before. Okay, what about your body? What do you want to leave? I said, what do you want to leave? What do you want to leave? Do you want to leave your heart? Do you want to leave? I mean, seriously, I would have thought, I mean, an Irish heart on eBay must be worth a lot of money, everyone. It must be worth a lot of money. So we sat there and we went through all of it. And then he said, well, what about what you own in this life? And it's not much, but we need to make decisions about it. It needs to be left to someone. And so we sat down and started talking about this. My mind just went to four kids, split it four ways, boom, you're done. But remember my wife, the spiritual one? 
she popped this question in that ruined everything. She said, but Andrew, what about the kingdom of God? Yes, darling, great question. I'm a pastor, I should have thought of that. What about the kingdom of God? And so we sat there and we made the decision that we wouldn't split it four ways, that we would split it five ways. And that the kingdom of God would get a fifth of everything we own in the world today. And we would leave that to the local church, to kingdom purposes, everybody. Now, my kids might be upset by this, but you know what? We won't be there. <laughs> they can pay for a counselor with their portion, okay? We won't be there. But there was something liberating at that moment in time where I thought, you know what? We're going to sow into the kingdom of God. And there's going to be stuff that's going to outlive our time here on earth. We're actually giving into eternity. And with the whole thought of the kids, this is it. You are sitting there and you're thinking, I've got to leave this all to the kids. Some of you are so wealthy that actually what you are going to leave to your children will not help them, but hurt them. Because they're not going to be trusting Jesus. They're going to be trusting you and what you left them. You see, yes, I want to give my kids a start in life, but only God can give them a purpose in life. You hearing what I'm saying, everyone? Only God can give them a purpose in life. So I'm encouraging you today. Celebrate 100%. Start today. Start giving 10%. Go out into this world and share whatever percent. As soon as God touches your shoulder, taps your heart, boom, let generosity be released. But I am saying to you, and this is how great churches and legacies are formed, Think about your future because we're all going the one way, everybody. Why not talk to yourself, talk to your spouse, and think about the 100% that we have to leave and think about, God, I want to go to eternity, but I also want to leave a legacy.